Hi guys and welcome back to the early bird photo news. Still from an Airbnb backyard but it's only going to be a few more weeks until we can move into our new house and I can build my own YouTube studio and then it's going to be so much easier to film but until then these makeshift studios just have to do and I guess having some nice sun and trees in the background can be nice as well. Today we're going to talk about some exciting topics like the new long-awaited Nikon 200 to 600 mm lens and if you watch till the end you're going to find out how much I sold my EF 600 mm f4 lens for. In one of my last episodes I shared with you that I broke my tripod head for my big lens tripod setup and that I needed a replacement. So I've actually gone ahead, done a lot of research and found a few heads that I liked so I ordered them. They're hopefully going to be arriving soon and there were also some heads that I liked but I didn't order them because I felt like something wasn't quite right. So I'm going to share all these findings with you in one of the next episodes. On the topic of tripods I was interested though, are you guys hand holders or do you like tripods? I must say personally I'm like 50-50. If I'm using my big lens I definitely prefer to use a tripod but if I'm using a smaller lens like 100 to 500 I think hand holding is quite a nice option because you're so much more flexible. In saying that I remember a quote from a famous German photographer who's no longer with us Fritz Poking and he said you become a better photographer once you use a tripod. His idea was that if you use a tripod you focus a lot more on composition because when you're hand holding you just goes kind of walking around and you can just quickly adjust and you're not paying as much attention to the composition of your images. Whereas if you're stuck on a tripod you have to think about a lot more where you're going to set up and it actually makes you a better photographer in the long run. Would you agree with that statement or not? I think there's some truth to it personally. This week I've been editing a few videos and photos on my M1 Max MacBook Pro and I found a few issues that started to really annoy me and I wanted to share some solutions with you and some I actually might need your help to fix. One of the biggest problems is that if you're running operating system Monterey on an M1 MacBook Pro, after about 30 seconds it starts to send your external hard drives to sleep. So for instance for my video editing I run an external RAID system with four 18 terabyte hard drives and I connect that to the Mac to be able to access my old video files. So far so good. But now whenever I'm working on my timeline, I'm not using the drive for 30 seconds, it goes to sleep. And then whenever I need it again, it has to reboot and that sometimes can take up to 20 seconds. So you're often just stuck waiting for your computer to restart your hard drives. Super annoying. And I've been reading in a lot of Apple forums, apparently this is a common problem, but Apple doesn't seem to care about it. So luckily I found this app called Amphetamine, and that allows you, once you install it, to activate something called Drive Alive, and that actually sends a little ping to your hard drive every 10 seconds, so the operating system doesn't send it to sleep, which for me has changed literally my editing life and makes it so much better now because now the hard drive is just running all the time as long as I have the computer on. That's so much better. The other issue I found ever since I updated to the latest Photoshop version is that whenever I want to delete a layer mask, it doesn't delete the layer mask, it actually applies it, which is also super annoying because I never really want to apply my layer mask. So if I drag a layer mask to the bin or press delete, it always gets applied and not deleted. The only way to delete the layer mask is actually to right click and then go delete layer mask. Does any one of you have any idea how to fix this issue? Is it something I clicked and I just can't find where to change it? I tried to google it but I also couldn't really find a solution. So if any one of you has a solution so that I can actually delete my layer mask again with just one click that would be greatly appreciated. Being in an Airbnb and editing all my photos on a laptop has actually been quite a bit of a challenge as well because I'm finding that the M1 MacBook Pro 16 inch screen is a little bit too green and also has much too dark blacks. So whenever I'm editing a photo I'm not entirely sure what the colors will look like. So my solution for now is that once I think I've finished the photo I actually send it to a few different phones, look at them on the different phone screens and then kind of find a middle ground where it looks good on all screens. It's not ideal but for now that seems to be working for me. And even though I had to overcome some of these obstacles, I managed to edit some of my favorite photos from last year. And the photos that I was the most excited about were these photos from the victorious rifle birds displaying in the deep dark rainforest. If you want to see how I took those photos in really low light conditions, make sure to check out that link above there. It's a great video and I know you will learn a lot. 
So since all these images were taken at very high ISO, I used sticks or Puro to get rid of the noise. Then I used my Pro sets to get the colors right with just one click. And then I used my masterclass workflow to make the images stand out. And if you guys want to learn all about image editing, my pro sets and my masterclass, make sure to check these out down there in the description. I know this will take your own image editing to the next level. Let's talk about the long awaited and often talk about lens, the Nikon 200 to 600. It's on the roadmap for 2023, so hopefully we're gonna see it in the next few months. The big question though is, will it be as good as the legendary Sony 200 to 600 millimeter lens? And can it come in at a similar price point? Because the Sony lens is definitely the benchmark when it comes to that sort of focal range. I've personally been using it on the i1. I was very impressed with it. It's nice and fast. It has a very short throw on the zoom. So it's very nice to zoom in and out. And it has great image quality and the best of it, it can even take a 1.4 extender as well. So it's an all around great lens that only costs about $2,000. So the value for money is through the roof with that lens. The Nikon 200 to 600 not being an S line lens makes me think that it can hopefully come in at a similar price point to the Sony right around that $2,000 mark. If not, if it's much more expensive, I don't think it makes a lot of sense to make that lens because then people will always compare to the Sony and say it's too expensive. But Nikon has shown recently that they are willing to produce cheaper lenses like the 800 6.3. So I'm very hopeful that the 200 to 600 will be very competitive when it comes to pricing. Will the Nikon 200 to 600 be as good as the Sony and can it take 1.4 extenders as well? We don't know at this stage, but I'm very hopeful that it will be a more than capable lens. What I think the lens will definitely have better than the Sony is the image stabilization. Because if you ask me about one thing I didn't like as much on the Sony, it was definitely the image stabilization. It just wasn't as smooth. And of course, there's another big question now. Why has Canon never made 150 or 200 to 600 millimeter zoom lens? They haven't done it for the EF mount and it doesn't look like they're planning it for the RF mount. There was a patent a while ago for 150 to 600 millimeter L lens, but personally I think it's probably not really gonna come to life because it's too similar with the great 100 to 500 millimeter lens Canon already has. At first glance, it definitely doesn't make sense because it's one of the most popular focal length for amateur wildlife photographers. Tamron, Sigma, and Sony, and soon Nikon all have lenses in this focal range and Canon only has 100 to 400 or 100 to 500 millimeter lenses, but they don't really compare to like a 150 or 200 to 600 millimeter lens. So why isn't Canon attempting to make these lenses? My only explanation is that Canon feels like they're in a lose-lose situation with this kind of lens because there's already so many cheap offerings that have pretty good quality. They feel like if they make a non-L lens and it's not as good as some of the other lenses, people will complain and this lens will not be very popular because people say, look at the Sony, it's so much better. And if they make it an L lens and it's actually better than the Sony lens, people will also complain because then the lens will be too expensive because I assume Canon would charge at least two to three times the Sony price if they made an L 200 to 600 millimeter lens. So maybe Canon just feels they're in this loose-loose situation and just say, screw it, we're just not going to attempt to make one of these lenses. Do you guys think that's what's happening? Let me know. If you're a Nikon shooter and you own a 600TC, 2.8 400TC, f4.5 400mm lens or f6.3 800mm lens, I recommend that you head over to the Nikon website and check out the new firmware that has been released for those lenses. On top of that, Nikon has also said that they're still going to be releasing firmware updates for the Z6 II and the Z7 II. And while that's great for the current owners, I think what's really missing at the moment is a cheaper camera that incorporates some of these specs and the great autofocus from the Z9 camera. Because let's say Nikon brings out a 200 to 600 millimeter lens and it's great, but you're not going to pair a $2,000 lens with a six or $7,000 Z9, are you? So Nikon definitely needs a camera that matches performance-wise the Z9, but has a lower price point. So a lens like a 200 to 600 can be paired with a great camera with great autofocusing, because I think even when they update the Z6 II or Z7 II, it's probably not really going to cut it. In the world of Sony, we also had some interesting releases this week. A 50mm and a 20 to 70 millimeter lens. And especially the 20 to 70 millimeter lens sounds like a great lens because having 4 millimeters more compared to 24 to 70 on the wider end will definitely be something that can be quite helpful in the field. 
Sony has also shared that they are developing a 2.8 300mm lens, definitely the lens that is missing from the current lineup and the lens that a lot of wildlife and sports shooters will cherish. We don't know much about the specs yet, but I would assume that the lens will be quite light, under 2 kilos, will have very fast autofocus and great image stabilization. The only problem then will be, if it has all that, that it will be quite expensive, but I think a lot of people don't mind, it will definitely buy a lens like that. I've also been reading that we will definitely be seeing a Sony A9 III camera this year. And what I find the most interesting about this camera is whether Sony will stick with a 24 megapixel or will push it into that 30 megapixel range. This is the camera that kind of competes with the Canon R3 and Canon decided to stick with a, or install a 24 megapixel so Sony wouldn't really have to push into the 30 megapixel range but personally I think if the A9 III had 30 megapixels it would be quite an interesting camera also for wildlife and I could possibly see myself buying a 200 to 600 with an A9 III for wildlife photography. What do you guys think? Is it going to be 24 megapixels or more? I'm sure the camera will have at least 30 frames per second and some amazing autofocusing features. Sony is also doing a long overdue and long awaited and very welcomed update to the i1 very soon. Apparently they are going to do a firmware update where they have a lot of AF features from the other Sony cameras coming to the a1. For instance they are finally going to have eye tracking in video mode in the a1 and I think that is something that was missing and is long overdue because not having eye tracking in video mode is something that I found very difficult to use in the field and I much rather have cameras like a Z9 or R5 that actually have tracking in video mode. So Sony now installing that in the a1 will be great. I recently sold my EF 600mm version 2 lens for right around 7500 US dollars and I think this is just a great example how well these big lenses hold their value. I bought the lens in about 2015 so I had it for right around 8 years and the lens hasn't lost much value. Of course if we adjust it for inflation it will have lost a little bit more value but I only lost like to $3,000 on the lens using it for 8 years. So basically for the cost of renting it for like a week or two, I got to use the lens for almost 8 years. So buying these big lenses is definitely not as risky as buying some other things because they tend to hold the value very well. In saying this, the version 2 600mm lens is one of the best lenses out there and in terms of image quality it's probably the best 600mm lens around. So if it wasn't for the RF lenses that are lighter and the RF teleconverters, I would have definitely not sold that lens. At the end I want to know something from you guys because the most requested type of video every day in my comments is more in the field content. Go out with your camera, show us how you take the bird photos. But whenever I do those videos, like I posted a few days ago, they do very poorly when it comes to views. So is it just a small, very loud minority that likes in the field content and everyone else hates it? Or do you like field content and you may have just not been shown the video? Which one is it for you guys? Are you a hater or do you love in the field content? Either way, if you think you're going to enjoy a video about Birds of Paradise displaying in difficult low light conditions where I show you exactly how I take the images and how you can deal with very high ISO up to 25,600 and beyond, make sure to check out the video that I posted a few days ago, you won't regret it. But before you do that, please make sure to give me a thumbs up for this video, let me know your thoughts in the comments and of course like always subscribe to the channel and I will see you in the next video very soon, bye guys!